I owe Deepak an apology before I start this because I left translation of temporary people halfway done. <laughs> and uh, Benjamin has spoken a little of it and I should complete his narrative by saying what was lacked in me was the experience of diaspora. And my diaspora experience is limited to my staying in the hostel away from home. So obviously my experience was not deep enough to comprehend much of what I uh, met in the book. So obviously Benjamin was the best person and I'm very curious to see what he has done to this narrative. I still have my uh, copy with me, whatever I did of it. I haven't thrown it away, but I'd like to see what Benjamin has done better about this. So uh, to you first, of course, when we are talking about chroniclers, that word chronicle is itself a deep word. It involves a lot of, um, again, experience, observation, and actual living in the skin of it. So like uh, Jumba Lahiri is spoken of as a third generation diaspora, and you have been spoken of by Benjamin as a second generation diaspora, how has your experience been the core of starting this book? Because people have always been writing about experiences which are not actually theirs and being successful. And you are being super successful with an experience that is totally yours. It is actually a little above. It's that sort of a book. So I am remembering uh, much of it right now sitting here. So please. I, I don't think you owe me an apology. <coughs> In fact, I think it takes a lot of guts to actually tell someone, I think I can't continue. So I'm quite grateful. Um, because I think, uh, now let me try and answer the question. Um, so I'm the third generation to live in the Gulf. So Mutta Chaudan died for a couple of years. He died there. But now to the crux of what you're asking me. Look, um, we were having dinner last night and my publisher was there, Kartika uh, VK. And she was asking me questions about Dipa Achana Mevada. So Natla, so Trishure. And then, you know, I was trying to explain this. I'm going to switch between English and Malayalam because I can test my Malayalam in Kerala every now and again, right? So I was saying, and I'm paraphrasing now. Ipo, namula girlfriend na or kumbho, chirupakar kore veru ndau. Naatla or kumbho, chirupakar aru illya. So I'm going to translate now for those who don't speak Malayalam. So in the Gulf, you find the young. And in places like the cities my parents come from, you find the elderly. So there's that gap. So to put it in Malayalam again, what a gap on the in-betweenness. So when I was younger, we tried to figure that out. Because Natla, like here in Kerala, there's this expectation or anticipation of what the Gulf Malayali is, the NRI. So for the most part, we don't know. Do you have the house? Ah. Kutiala, children. Ah. And the Jaina, what are they doing? Uh, doctor, lawyer, banker. Ah. So you're checking off a bunch of things because you have to objectify your experience. But the other stuff, um, what do you do when you don't get any of these things? We don't have a conversation about that. In my own family, we don't talk about this. So when people say I'm the chronicler, it's a little bit embarrassing because there are many names. Not just me, not just Benjamin. You know, Sabin is right here as well. There are others. And I think the problem I have is in Kerala, there's this one-sided expectation of what the Gulf Malayali is supposed to be. Uh, and that didn't sit very well with me. Uh, and you know, uh, you're very generous in how you position the book, uh, saying that it went beyond what it was supposed to do. Um, I think that's an exaggeration to a point, because if it did that, this would be a crowded house. Like people, like it would be like you're trying to get into see Tovino Thomas, or you know Dulkar Salman, and they're like, "Ara ara, diva kana." Okay, we'll, they'll all come, but that's that's not the case here. And I think part of the problem is, um, for me, the book is about language. It's not necessarily just about migration. Like what happens to a language when you infuse Malayalam with English, with some Hindi, some Urdu, which are languages I grew up hearing, Arabic as well. What do you do to the book itself when you do that? 
Kind of, I didn't know what I was doing. Like I can pretend all I want saying that I knew exactly how the book was supposed to function, but I didn't. I'm not trained in literature. I teach literature for a living. Uh, and I'll stop talking now because the main issue is when you teach for a living, you like the sound of your own voice. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is when you say chronicler, I'm thinking about what that means on a base level. Like when I sit with my parents to eat, we don't talk about the Gulf. Like it doesn't come up in conversation. Like there's a lot of silence. So I don't even know how to ask my own father, what happened? So when Sabin translated, so it's interesting he's sitting right next to me. So Madhrabhumi, to their detriment, put me on the cover of Madhrabhumi Weekly a few years ago thinking I am the next big thing. Really sorry, because this is being recorded. I'm not. But Sabin translated that interview. It was around seven to eight pages long. And so when he sent it to me in Malayalam, I can't read Malayalam, by the way. I can only read English. I can speak it fairly well. I asked Acha, Acha, no, it's okay. So can you please read it? I said, why? I said, just so that I know he hasn't messed up. He didn't mess up. So this is what he did. He was sitting right next to me, my own father. And he starts reading it out loud. And then he's embarrassed and I'm embarrassed. Because I'm talking about stuff that we don't talk about as a family. Silence. Thanks. Exactly. So what Achan did was, So I'll take it, record it, come back to you, give it to you, you listen to it. That is the only time in my family that my father knew that I knew and my mother knew that I knew, and I owe that to Sabin. So we needed a third party interference to sort of figure out how do you open the conversation. So that's, that's what I've got. Before coming to the others, I think I should ask you one more question, Deepak. Kartika has uh, mentioned that, um, although your book has been discussed much here, it hasn't been you know, really re documented on how you chose these stories and why you chose these stories, how you came about to write these stories. I think you should uh, speak up a bit about this. So I'm going to talk about race and class. So most of you may presume you know what the Gulf is. So the Gulf is very brutal in its hierarchy. So right on top is the Khaliji or the Imarati, like the person who's the local. Underneath the Imarati, you have the Arabic speakers to a certain degree, but depending on where they come from, they get treated differently. So the Sudanese does not have as much clout as the Lebanese because of what they look like. Even above them sit the Americans and the Brits. Now why this hierarchy is relevant is because in the Gulf, like if you go to a cafeteria, you're not going to find an American who's going to be serving you coffee. You'll be finding someone from Malaparam. Ah, not loud here. And then you start a conversation, or a in a samosa. You're not going to have this conversation with an American. So basically what this means is professions are relegated by nationality. So I grew up in an environment where I just presumed Malayalis only work in cafeterias. If a Malayali is an investment banker or a CEO of a company, that's a big deal. And we have a tendency as Malayalis to sort of highlight the use of Adis of the Gulf. People who have done really well. Those who don't do as well, like my father, my Ammawans and some of my Ammais, we don't talk about them. So I think I started thinking about what does it mean to write a story and do that without pitying them. This is crucial. This is not a pity party. This is not about me writing about people and saying, are you a power? Because that's usually what happens in these conversations. And you just start getting extremely frustrated because our humor is very, very dark. So even if you think about the cliche of if when we sent the, whatever that space thingy was to the moon, and there was this meme floating around with a Malayali with a Taktagada or something serving kapi to the robot. So we have that kind of darkness infused in our psyche. So I wanted to write a book that, want, that would make you laugh. So that when my Achin and my Amma picked it up, they'd say, ayyo. But at the same time, there'll be that twinkle. Like, you see what George is looking like right now? Exa that <laughs> twinkle in his eye? That's, that's what I wanted. So I think at the end of the day, I wanted to write a book that was mine. About the white China, you know, this cannot be written by Sabin or Benjamin or George. It's written by someone else. So you need to ask why. 
And I think that was fundamental to why, uh, how I approach work. So I wrote the book, and you should ask four questions to two of them after I stop, because I've talked for a while. I wrote the book with the understanding that nobody was going to publish it. Because on the surface, even now, they listed me under national writers. I've never lived in India. Uh, in the US, I'm the writer from the Gulf. In the Gulf, I'm the writer from India. So you know, when you have all of these presumptions about who someone is expected to be, uh, it frees you up a little bit. Because in my head, I'm going to publish it. I don't publish it. And no one's going to publish it. So I wanted to write whatever I wanted so that I kept my dignity which is something we don't talk about here as well. Like, what does it mean to compromise your dignity when you work in the Gulf? Not from an extreme angle, but from a very different kind of angle. Karim, you're young, for the most part. My father left in the 70s. You're like in your mid-70s or in your 60s, you're older. And the state doesn't want you anymore, unless you have the mansion or whatnot. But that, that'll be a rant, which I don't want to get into. But that's why I just wanted to write something that made me smile. And at the same time, it was honest enough where I could sit with it and go, I gave it everything. That's probably why I'm a one book wonder, peaked early. Uh, and Madhubhumi is sort of regretting putting me on the cover. <laughs> but Harper Lee is still around, one book wonder? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, the final thing I'll say is, thank God for people who are willing to take risks. Thank God for people who care. I mean, there's Benjamin, there's Kartika VK, but there's also Kartika Nair, Swaroop, even George. Because I just walked up to him in France and said, hey, because I did the illustrations myself, terrible. I said, I need some help. And he said, Chia. So just the gesture of someone saying, let me do this, because I'm interested to do this, uh, is quite sobering. It's also extremely humbling. Anyway, it's not normative for me. Uh, acts of kindness, which we don't talk about at literary festivals. What does it mean to be a writer? For the most part, you need someone to be kind to you. In my case, you needed a village, really. Tell us about how your chronicling has been. About these temporary people. You yeah. have a lot of temporary people in your Hala Hala world. Oh, yeah. Yes. So talk yeah. about the Hala Hala world first. And then the temporary people. He is a graphic artist, basically. And his graphic novel is one of the wonders I have read in my life. Thank you. It's a beautiful Sunita. book. It's a series. Sunita wrote a great review on it also. <laughs> Uh, Hold so it closer. Hold it close. Yeah. <coughs> All right. So I, I, I make comics. I have a few comics out. Uh, but this is about temporary people. Uh, it wasn't like I was being very generous or so nice to Deepak or anything. I read the book. It just blew my mind. It was awesome. And I looked at the cover and it did not convey like what the book was about to me. And I felt like, you know, like I, f I really felt for the book. I thought it was great and I thought if I can like convince this guy like you know there's another like way to put it out it's probably coming from my advertising background or something uh, that you know the presentation like we all judge the book uh, on the cover actually so I thought that cover played into this trope of being uh, a book about the Middle East by some Middle East thing you know it's usually all sad like when you talk about like this Middle East story there are some statistics and they like some people disappeared and things like that so it was not like that at all and it should not look like that I thought like it had to like there was a lot of like color and many creatures and all coming out at me when I was reading the book it's 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 so vibrant uh, so, <laughs> so I really wanted to like see if you know we c I mean I thought that would be a good thing I can do to this great book if I can just like put that out there um, as a version of look as a way of looking at that same book like uh, you know so that's how I, 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 re I really I really thought and what the book was saying about the um, humor in some way it, it really got me like it's uh, my comics are supposed to be or called dark um, sometimes mostly uh, this was speaking right to me like there was no like I, it's like I read the book and I just want to hang out with Deepak you know like, I'm like hey man like let's chill <laughs> but like Deepak was like no let's not chill let's like do something <laughs> yeah so that's how I came into this and uh, we, we've done a few things inside, which I think is kind of new for a book like this. Um, where um, the Deepak played with me a lot. Like he, uh, he told me to look at the Pravasi chapter. 
it's the strangest chapter in the book like i mean it's a book full of strange chapters but like this one was like okay what do i do it's got like painter <laughs> carpenter hooker horse looker like you know it's going like that so uh, then we decided to like give it a shot of illustrating and also to make this temporary person a sort of a design unit a very neutral design unit like you see in the signages in uh, airports and stuff so you have you have just this very uh, blank sort of canvas as a person as a as a figure uh, and he's designed in such a way that if you arrange them next to each other they sort of build like bricks so it fits into they they fit into each other so these are all thoughts that came while reading the book like uh, that's why it's temporary people uh, you know you can just make cities out of them or discard them uh, so i thought i should bring that kind of thing into the uh, visual narrative also to add to this craziness that deepak has cooked up you know and uh, for me like i just wanted to like say this is mad like you <laughs> got to read this yeah that's what What about Hala Hala World? You didn't say anything about it. Well, Hala Hala World, I'm having a session at 4 o'clock. I'll talk only oh, about okay. Hala Hala okay, World. Okay, right, like, right. I'll give you that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Hala Hala World is great. Like, everybody <laughs> should read this Hala Hala series. It's awesome. <laughs> it's like dark uh, and funny comics, you know. There's a lot of political stuff also. Like, you know, there's Rashtra Man. He's like superhero of Rashtriya. Things like that. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's a labyrinth. You can get, never get out of it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sabin, now you are a grown-up temporary man. Pe- not people, a man. So, uh, as a Gulf uh, chronicler and as somebody with the Middle East experience, how do you think you are different from these two, his graphic version of it and Deepak's? Uh, yeah. um, before I talk about it, I just want to say a few things. Um, you know, Deepak uh, signed my copy of uh, uh, Temporary People with this. thank you for the interview so that my parents could read it you know that's what you i don't know you remember but you know i said when i read the temporary people it really you know it, it really captivated me and at that time i was writing shamal days my own little book no one has read so but then uh, i didn't read it when you know i was writing this book i didn't want to be influenced by uh, his kind of writing um mine is entirely different and uh, uh, um deepakas blurb that i don't know whether he's read it but uh, <laughs> 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 so so as uh, benjamin so <laughs> so now uh, i i'm a child of uh, gulf my father left to the gulf in 75 um for me my father was an annual warmth a warmth that used to come to us every year then after you know number 30 days he would go back and he never wanted me to go but in this book i have written about sons meeting fathers under an acrimonious sun their shadows merge you know this is a different take on you know entirely different world that deep but i am quite familiar with the streets that deep because i lived there for 15 years so uh, uh, so all the javasa throat passport road and you know it's all familiar to me so when i was reading temporary people and the that that pravasi chapter you say four man one you know it's, it's a very beautiful very very innovative chapter where there's nothing but the names of uh, the pro- the the people who work like you know four man i know so many four four men working in the in the labor said that that connect me to my memory my experience of carpentry or, or, or you know uh, those who work at the uh, sites so that's 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 our connected but then but th- let me talk about shamal the day so this has gone into the lock lock lockdown period you know so i had so much of hope in this novel but the covid came and so many uh, hopes had dashed my novel also got into the lockdown period but in this my protagonist is uh, is is a uh, is an editor Uh, so they sat in a, n- a newspaper room. There, there are Sud- Sudanese, Somalis, Russians, uh, Chinese, I've, uh, and and lot of Europeans and and working under uh, Indians and Pakistanis and Bangladeshi working under an English editor. So this is my world of the 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 temporary people. 
And in interestingly, I dedicated the book to for the generations of temporary people in the Arabian Gulf. Thank you only for giving me that, you know, that coin. There's a lot of sadness in the book, in temporary people. No, but it's not that visible, but it is sad. But I think that sadness of uh, Pravasi life has been handled differently by Deepak and Sabin. And I haven't really seen those illustrations, so I cannot play, uh, place a comment on it. Can you talk about that? How did you cover that sadness? How did you make that sadness uh, bloom out in your words? Both of you. Yeah. No, my book, someone wrote this is this cannot be read. It's so so sad and so you know uh, depressing book. You know, I've I've read that in some of the major dailies. He said this is a very sad book. Can't read it. You know, but then yeah, the way you put it, see, Gulf people in the in the Gulf. Uh, I always say this, the most uh, unique expatriate community in the entire world. They can own anything. I mean, I know how many generations they lived. You know, they, you, you just have something, a sad box tucked under your, your bed. You have to leave any time. That kind of a temporariness, the permanence of temporariness. That's what, that is what I've lived for 15 years there. I had to come back. My father came back with three boxes of books and cancer in his lungs. He went there to make money, he couldn't make any. You know, there are so many stories out there. You know, so, yes, I put out the, you know, people were like, you know, this book is a deep character study of Abbas. He's lonely. He's, 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 he's got no one in his life. So there is sad. Yeah, I put the sadness bluntly across. But this guy has done some magic with it. So let him say how he handled it. See, this is an interesting question. So when I was around six or seven years old, I don't know if m most of you are familiar with the movie Ek Duje Ke Liye, right? By Kamal Hassan and... Was it Sri Devi? I think so. Oh, sorry. Rathiya Agnihotri, okay. And they have this moment towards the end. I'm not giving anything away. They just die. But they die so dramatically. And even Malayalam movies, the minute you go, ten, nine, nine, and you know something's about to go down, right? So the fact that sadness is exclusively a Deepak Kurnikrishnan trope is actually not true. There's also this thing about nuance when you think about sadness. And I'll give you a very specific example. And before I do that, I have a student who's actually studying Shamal days. We've, we've read it. Um, there's also Yasin Kakande, who's a Ugandan journalist who was deported from the Gulf, uh, who has a memoir, it's called An Ambitious Struggle. And I don't think a lot of it is about sadness, I think it's about the hustle. And here's the example. There's a gentleman whose name is Rafiq Ravutar. He used to have a show called Pravasi Logam. And there's this one story that he recited to my students that I absolutely adore. So there was a family where the husband went missing in action, somewhere in Europe, I think, not necessarily the Gulf. So he was hunting for this guy, and that's what the whole show was about. So if people couldn't trace their family members, Rafi could kick into gear and he'll find them. He found the guy, returned him to Kerala. They had this huge party and everything. And towards the end, the wife sort of asks Rafiq, and you know, if this was a film, it'll go, pss, 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 you know, come here, let's have a conversation. And he bas she basically said, thank you. Now can you take him back? <laughs> so when you think about, you know, what sadness is, you have the surface level skim of what everyone expects the situation to be. And then you have the nuances in play. Uh, and for me, I think the nuances are actually quite relevant. Like take, I mentioned houses before. My parents are from Trishur. We love big houses. Like, um, I think it's one of the jewelry guys, the Alukas dude. This is recorded, right? Yeah, okay, the Alukas dude, who has a mansion that's actually called Mansion uh, in Trishur. Like, they have it in bold letters. It's as though you don't know what a mansion looks like. So just in case you missed it, I'm going to tell you it's a mansion. For me, this is hilarious at the end of the day. But now back to Sadlis, we also have houses in Trishur that are huge. They're like colossal bungalows and whatnot, but they're also empty. So in my head, I'm sort of going, if they have dogs, and apparently in Kerala, you like breeds, like if it's a German shepherd or a Nadambati Argushtala, they want like the Doberman or the, you know, the, the great breeds. These guys can sort of get themselves into the house and have their way with the world. But this is how I think. 
but at the same time to answer the question seriously i think for me sadness is an evolved emotion it takes stages when my grandfather died in abu dhabi it was a sad moment he died in 83 but when they shipped his body back they also shipped the toyota corolla with him which i find ridiculous it's quite bizarre like mutajam boy which have a toyota and there so you know uh, grandpa's gone but we have the toyota which in the 80s was a big deal so when you think about these decisions that people make and then how they sort of figure their way out with the world i think about those things so but even as i'm growing older like for right now me and i'll end with this i'm considered to be the elder in the gulf that's bizarre like for someone who's in his early 40s for people to look at me and going there goes the wise old unni krishnan you you need to have a conversation with him and he'll tell you what the gulf was like and that's me making a joke but now let me get serious it's also about the policy you can't find a 75 year old man wandering around playing cards or drinking karlu with his 75 year old buddies because the policy does not permit that they have to leave they have to be returned so to speak unless you're rich so being rich gives you access we celebrate yusuf ali for a reason because it's easy to celebrate him so i think for me you know at the end of the day is i think sadness is also a valid emotion but the validity is based on what your context is my context is about ensuring that i am not my father i do not want to stay in the gulf with family members dying and not being able to go see them i don't want to do that anymore but even as i say this and saban should go i know it's a privileged uh, performance that i'm sort of putting on here because my document has changed i'm no longer indian i'm american which means that i could land up almost anywhere that i haven't bombed as a country and expect people to sort of say come on yankee whatever which is not the case when you're indian you know and we found that out during covid especially where the system the hierarchical system was very clear so i think for me at the end of the day more more than sadness it's about something very fundamental that if i'm of a very different generation my generation is not interested in gratitude my parents generation was all about gratitude ah abu dhabi you know we have so much to love about the place karim namaga onnum kittilla evada illinga you know we won't get anything if you're not here and i'm like that doesn't make any sense so for me it's about engaging with the city with the foundation in being able to be honest because i think honesty gets taken away from you when you're in a place like the gulf uh sunid i'll take the liberty to read two paragraphs because uh, i was about it, to ask you, you know, to do that it's about the fathers and sons and if you are uh these old men see the when you go to the cornish you you have you have uh, you can see all kinds of people sitting by the cornish which is a you know uh, how do you put it cornish is cornish right huh okay yeah so uh these old men sitting by the cornish at you know and pensively looking at the sea had never experienced the mountains and the sea which they crossed in their youth and the deserts they toiled under a fierce sun for their family offered them neither respite nor no consolation this uh, they also realized that they didn't have the energy to take more voyages on high seas against rising waves colors no longer excited their dusty imaginations neither did fragrance bring back memories of songs of their youth the sun sets over sand dunes and a pallid sea didn't make them romantic anymore nor did voluptuous women awaken the paramour in them they remembered their distant wives and the shadowy interiors of their far away homes where they held their newly weds close for the first time oblivious to their nascent shyness their eyes were their eyes were clouded with tears their muscles ached the mists of grief shrouded their hearts in a way abbas the protagonist in a way abbas too was one among the thousands of youngsters who followed their fathers to the desert country abbas father had worked for many summers in the mountainous northern part of the desert country by the time he returned home abbas had realized his own desire to leave home thank you thank you I think I should come to Apu now. 
don't get so scared <laughs> see it's impossible to read out i mean what he has done uh, i have still have to go through it completely but from what i've seen I've, i just looked at this chapter pravasi which you are talking about and i could see why you did this this illustration can you talk about how you came to do it i mean how you chose the illustration some part of it just uh, like we were saying earlier it, it had to fit into a unit the, this is this is a a figure which can become anything uh, that's what i thought like you know deepak stories were showing also like all these like little dolls or something you you take it there and you can paint whatever you want on it that kind of a feel so i just took on like about 60 of these professions this can i just uh, read this a bit so that you can uh -huh, get to it yeah ഈ ചാപ്റ്റർ മലയാളത്തിൽ ഉള്ളത് ഞാൻ വായിക്കുകയാണ് ഇത്ര ഇതിനകത്ത് ഓരോ പ്രൊഫഷൻ്റെ പേര് പറഞ്ഞ് അവിടെ നിർത്തുകയാണ് അതായത് അധികം ഒന്നും പറയുന്നില്ല തയ്യൽക്കാരൻ ഫുൾ സ്റ്റോപ്പ് വേശ്യ ഫുൾ സ്റ്റോപ്പ് കുതിരനോട്ടക്കാരൻ വേലക്കാരി ഒട്ടക സവാരിക്കാരൻ ചരിത്രകാരൻ നേഴ്സ് എണ്ണക്കാരൻ വ്യാപാരി കാർ ഡ്രൈവർ വാച്ച്മാൻ പൊറോട്ട അടിയൻ സെക്രട്ടറി തോട്ടക്കാരൻ ഇറ്റ് ഗോസ് ഓൺ ദിസ് വേ ഫോർ എ കപ്പിൾ ഓഫ് പേജസ് ആൻഡ് അറ്റ് ദി എൻഡ് ഓഫ് ഇറ്റ് It says, Loga Sanjari, Diva Sopnakaran, Nagaram Nirmikinnavan, Rajyam Nirmikinnavan, Ida Mundakinnavan, Tholilali, Vilay Illathavan, Vilay Illathavan, Vilay Illathavan. This is how it ends. It mentions every single profession that could be associated with a job in the Gulf. And that's what Deepak has tried to put into graphics. So I'd like him to continue. That's a... Uh that's one of the central things we took off from there were also some illustrations that deepak had done already which is we sort of embellished and like cleaned up because those were key to the book uh, there was the crane visual uh, in the beginning of the book itself so i made it like i i knew what deepak was trying to do he were in his his drawing he had made the crane out of figures so i just wanted the figures to fit better so you know it looks like a solid crane Uh, so we made this kind of a block kind of character who can fit into each other and uh, so that i can make them into anything uh, as we go on so then we put all these professions on them then there are a couple of others also and it ends also like i think there's a nice part at the end where uh, something deepak said like struck that uh, image it neutralizes them into a single unit at the end of uh, it somewhat yeah there's that mm -hmm. single solitary figure at the end really worked and then suddenly deepak was also like hey that we, we should work on that yes. one right <laughs> so uh, it was pretty cool like so basically just creating that one template model and changing it so much yes. Na, and it's uh, I'm, i'm right now i'm putting it into an animation loop uh, of all of them coming together and it uh, looks kind of nice like yeah i think that uh, that metaphor of temporary people has really come through i mean it is exactly as what you have written at first read you know you try to get okay what's this guy done here then you get through it and when you find each profession in it then you know you are actually pulling them all into one big hole and saying these are all temporary so appu has done that i mean as far as i can see has done that really well so anything more to say about this yeah while reading i suddenly saw like they, there are repeats hmm. and then i was like deepak there are repeats he's like yeah <laughs> he's hidden them there mm. and like only if you go at that uh, like if you list them out or something mm. you'll see like you know there are i think there are five drivers or like you know the, mm. the, the some of them are more mm. so uh, that also works in a way but it's like yes. a little play inside that he's put also yeah that's what i'm going to ask him next <laughs> <laughs> deepak i'd like you to talk about the language play in it so while i'm talking about it you know you know when i watch videos of literary festivals in india and you have writers in kurta pajama and they look they really rock it i'm dying here man so i'm going to give you guys a salman khan moment and sort of <laughs> unbutton myself as as i speak um look here's the thing about language right um so i speak english english is my bridge it's what i use to sort of think and reflect so as you're asking me the question i'm introspecting and trying to kill myself with the microphone but i'm introspecting with english so i can reflect so solitude is possible with english malayalam thana pattilla 
Like I can't do that in Malayalam because I need you to ask me a question in Malayalam mm. for me to think about it and respond. And this is mm. crucial because for me, Malayalam is used in the house. So when I speak to my parents, it's in Malayalam. They understand English, but it's not to the sophistication that I weave English with. So it's important to them and it's important to me. So, you know, I've said it before. When I stop speaking in Malayalam, my parents are dead. Uh, and the reason I say that is because my body moves very differently in the register wh when I speak Malayalam. So I teach a course at New York University which is about food. And one of the assignments that my students need to really do is go to a restaurant, order something Indian-ish, and eat it with your fingers. So most of them sort of struggle with this because they're like, this is, no, we don't do these kinds of things. But what's interesting is, then they started noticing me, because so I'd sort of do the same thing. And I'd say, Professor, you move differently when you eat. Like everything is like moving a different way. So even when you walk into so a shop, I say cafeterias a lot because they were very important to my childhood. And Saban can sort of testify as well. And the number one question is, not And so, you know, and the lit da 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 And you sort of, sort of wonder, what do you, how do you do that with English? You genuinely can't. So then the question is, I started thinking about rhythm and register, which is very important to me. The irony is I'm partially deaf in my left ear now. But when I was writing it, I sort of started wondering, what does it mean to use a language like English, which is your bridge, but you're sort of trained to speak it a certain way. So I went to an Indian school in the Gulf. And in the Indian school system, as most of you know, you're trained to think like the BBC. Hello, sir. And that's how you speak and the registers, right? Because when you speak like that, people notice. And then I started paying attention to Malayalam cinema. And they'd always caricature the NRI. You know, so when the NRI shows up in Kerala, wherever, and they speak Malayalam, it's like so amplified the accent. Nyan Chicago Lane. Nyan Ivete Amavanam Amayin Kanam Veru Ane. And you, you sort of listen to this nonsense and you go, nobody speaks like that. But at the end of the day, it's also, you know, people presuming that you don't care about the language. I mean, I have an accent, I know that. But at some point, the accent disappears. And that's because I have starting trouble, as they say here. So you start with English. And then you have to switch. Switch in as I mean, you know, like your ignition sort of goes that way. And then at some point, the body changes. So when I'm with my Amman and my Amais, we don't speak in English, we have to speak in Malayalam, right? They don't make fun of me because they understand that the single objective here is communication. That you just want to know if you're okay and at the same time they, they'll tell me, Like I don't really understand what you're saying but keep talking. Because my references are different. Right? So I started thinking about languages exactly that. And my Hindi is pretty good, but the problem now is you switch from English to Malayalam to Hindi and the brain goes into overdrive and they don't know, Are bhai, kya kar tu? And you, you don't know what to do now. And then I also speak Urdu and I understand it. But again, there's starting trouble. So because English is the bridge, and I had to learn Arabic when I was younger, I sort of started wondering, what do you do if you put everything into a little bit of a sambar-like situation. What does that mean? And politically, it's a political act at the end of the day. The fact that you're sort of told English needs to function a certain way. My students struggle with this as well. I teach for an American institution. When they show up, if they're Malayali, for instance, they sound like cousins of mine. They're fluent. But in their fourth year, they're as American as it gets, man. And you sort of wonder, what happened to you? But it's not a diss, because it's also self-preservation, because you want to fit in. There's this thing about assimilation, which is why, going back to the Malayali portrayal of what it means to be an NRI, I don't think we're performing the accent all the time. But I think the problem here, when I did a festival a few years ago, I love Kerala, by the way, but my God, this place is difficult. Because someone said at the Q&A, can you say something in Malayalam? So, yeah, so, so in my head, I'm going, so, so I don't know what to, so my head is now into overdrive because it's like you're in CBSE school and someone is saying, say patram. <laughs> and you sort of wonder, you're be, because you're 
put on display, right? You're performing your Malayaliness. And you sort of wonder why. Because my experience is about being a child who had to understand transience in such a manner that you couldn't claim anything. You couldn't claim the city you were from. You couldn't claim the country you were from. Nobody was interested in you. So you're doing your best to count. And I think at the end of the day, and I'll stop now, because it is about language. I think the musicality is important to me. So I don't move like a puppet when I land in Kerala because I want to fit in. I move like a puppet because my father is like that. So I'm mimicking my achan in many ways. But at the same time, I also realize that there's an incompleteness that I can't fix. So the Malayaliness is only present when I write and when I speak, N not anywhere else. Is that a case of temporary people also? Allah, not at all. I, th I don't, I said, look, when I was, I wrote the book when I was young. When you're young, you think you're important. And when you're young, you think your story really counts. I think temporariness in some ways is a little bit of a privilege because you know how to sort of plug and play in different situations. But at the same time, I think the issue is you have to think about your context. I make more money in one month than my father ever saved in 45 years. So I think about race and class quite a bit. Like It's not a boast, it's just an unfortunate yes. truth. So then you think about, all right, what does temporariness mean? It's easier to talk about it in a highfalutin language when you're young. When you age, there's this desperation that sets in because you want to make sure when you leave, you're not lonely. And it's not just about sadness. I think it's about you want to meet someone like Saban and, and not give him the history of the Gulf. You just want to plug and play the conversation. Saban, you lived in the Gulf? And then we know. So it's like a, there's a code in there. So I, I guess I, I do want the takeaway to be, if you get the book, um, by the way, he's got a dope-ass book coming out, George, so you need to attend that session at four. It's important. But the thing is, when you read me, I don't want you to pity me. I don't want you to pity my family. I don't want you to pity various generations. When you read me, I need you to understand I'm from Abu Dhabi. And there's a very special significance to that statement. I'm not ashamed of it, embarrassed of it. I had no control of it. So at the end of the day, I r write to be read. It's a very narcissistic act for me. You know, so when you have people, I don't know most of you, except five of you, and you're listening to me, bloody hell, man, it's a privilege. But I don't want you thinking that I write like the others. I want to stand out. So George is part of this because I wanted the book in Malayalam to land. Uh, and, you know, I think that's what it is at the end of the day. You speak a language because you want to be heard. You also speak a language because you want to move and sound a certain way. Thank you, Deepak. That's very clear. <laughs> uh, Sabin, you want to add something to it? Yeah, I want to chip in the other side of uh, what Deepak has said of temporariness. He's, he's seeing it from, you know, from, from the other side of the Arabian Sea. But here, I come from a, uh, the town which is a Gulf pocket. You know, we see people, they say, Ennu, Ennu, when did you come? Next question, Ennu, Bo, when are you leaving? So we, I have grown up between these two questions. Ennu vannu, ennu bohu. All my cousins, you know. You come to Varkala, see there's not even one house where there is not even you know, someone working in the Gulf. You know, you, you become 18, you got a passport, you're not doing well here. Chavte vitake, kete vitake. You know, kete vitake. You know, that usage is very, 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 you know, important. Kete vita, kete vita. Where? Dispatch where? sort of thing. Hmm? Dispatch him. Dispatch, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's like cargo. You know, so so that is my 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 feeling of I grew up like a as I told you I don't want to repeat annual warmth. For me, my father was an annual warmth. I uh, he used to write letters, long letters to me when I was growing up. He used to draw, he used to uh, draw well, and you know, he used to teach me present tense and past tense and all that. In my forthcoming book, I don't want to give it away, but th that is the chapter when when my father the, the father figure dies, the English teacher dies. You know, when father died, symbol past. You know, that's that is going to come out later this year. So, but you know, I don't think. And hope uh, George is doing the cover. <coughs> ah, sorry. Uh, Apu. So, Apu, do you want to rap? Uh, no, I I'll sing like. Uh, I know you have another <laughs> session, but we want to rap this. <laughs> no. Please add. I think um, 
you were talking about sadness earlier yes uh, i was thinking you don't look see, sad enough yeah i'm not like <laughs> see there is sadness like we don't have to look for it or we don't like there are there, there are ways in which you see it or take it like there are like sometimes i'm conscious about like uh, how we portrayed in our movies for example like if it's a cheap movie like you know they're always like crying all over the place uh if it's a tamil movie they always like uh, exaggerate a little more we used to exaggerate a lot more in theater so i think i like the way in which this is being dealt with in this book uh it's a very nuanced take on it that's what i liked and that's what i related to because even in comics and all what we're trying to do or we're trying to hone that voice like how to how to like put this world in perspective uh there is sadness in it when you put it in perspective but our job is not to dwell on that our do- job is to like you know to g- take something from it sometimes like you know i, I don't know why people are sometimes sad or, uh, like uh, they don't like the sadness because for me that is also a creative well like when you're feeling sad also there is there is a, like a a bunch of ideas like coming out from there so i think like this book is is like you know it's like a well of that kind of energy for me uh, that's the best i can rap anybody else want to rap <laughs> so this question is for deepak you mentioned temporary people from abu dhabi now you live in new york you said oh you still D- didn't you say you teach at new york university in in abu, in abu dhabi oh okay i'm sorry so then i don't have a question <laughs> Yeah hi uh, my question is to Deepak and my question is also about 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 language in the book so there is a story where the somebody's tongue uh, where somebody's tongue is detached from their mouth and it goes running uh, on the street and and uh, you know and it gets run over by traffic and there's this line where you say that verbs adjectives and adverbs died at the scene and the surviving nouns tadpole size see through fell like hail and i thought that a lot in your book is exploring the limits of english as a language and trying to do things that english normally doesn't allow you to do so i was wondering perhaps you could talk a little bit about exploring the limits and breaking the limits of language in temporary people i so i'll give you a little bit of bla- back story about that particular chapter so it's called glossary in english malayalathala i forget exactly what it's been titled So I was asked by one of my editors and he meant it in a sweet and kind way because the book was first published in the US in New York. And so he asked would you index some of the words? Or would you provide a glossary for the readership? And so you know I like mischief so I wrote back and said what readership I don't think anyone's going to read this. He said no for people who are unfamiliar with the words that you're using in the languages that you're using in would you give them something to hold on to? So I thought about it for a long time and you know I wrote back and this happened even at the university that I went to the book was my thesis uh, and I was being asked by my professors and the justification was you will have more people who are willing to read you so I thought about it for a long time right and I'll give you an example I don't speak French I know there are French speakers in the audience my apologies and ad- oh okay I'm really sorry man about what you're going to hear so say croissant right or as my great uncle puts it cross and it right so when i saw the word for the first time it didn't say croissant or cross and the flaky buttered pastry that's been placed in the oven for a while i had to look it up so then i thought you want an index i'll give you an index so i started writing glossary with the intention to sort of demonstrate uh, that language is about curiosities at the end of the day uh, I th- I'm not going to say language is limitless because I'm very cognizant of the fact that I'm talking about the written word. What if you can't hear? If you belong to the deaf community with a capital D, uh, I know in some of the sessions I think or when I was watching the news yesterday, you have sign language interpreters and here too. Okay. So you know th- this presumption that the written text is the only thing that's holy is also a bit nonsensical. So I get for me when I wrote it it was about putting forward a position as gently and vociferously as possible even though that sounds oxymoronic and now when i think back on it i'm glad i did it because i think at the end of the day it's about i operate in languages uh, and i know the gentleman with the microphone is saying tirna tirna so i'm going to end now right saying i want to make sure when i write something you will not forget me it's important uh, 
Um, and I think that's where the chapter came from. I think that's all. We'll have to wrap. Thank you so much for coming and good evening.